Bruchem Aboim. Welcome to our home. Again, thank you very much for attending. So, the uh, lecture this week, on my thought, is it a six or is it a nine? Again, so this week on my thought, I'd like to examine the number six and the number nine and see how they pertain to Orthodox Judaism. The Hebrew word for false is sheker. It has a gematria, a numerical value of 600. Now, according to Kabbalah, we can drop the two zeros. That just leaves us with the number six. So the number six alludes to falsehood. The Hebrew word for truth is emet. It has a gematria, a numerical value of 441. It's 4 plus 4 plus 1 is 9. And 9 times any other number always comes back to 9. For example, 2 times 9 is 18. 1 and 8 is 9. 4 times 9 is 36. 3 and 6 is 9. It, it, really, it makes no difference what number you use. 9 times any number will always come back to 9. Truth. In English, this concept works out very well. The side of evil will tell you many times that the number six, it's really a nine. It just fell over. I think that there is a better answer as to why the number six and the number nine look alike. There are times when a six, something that is false, can actually be true. And vice versa, there are times when a nine can become a six, false. For example, if you have a multiple choice exam with five answers to each question, Three of the answers are wrong. The fourth answer is correct. However, the fifth answer is definitively right. So if the fifth answer is not there, then the fourth answer would be correct. However, since the fifth answer is there and it is definitively correct, that makes the fourth answer wrong. Six. So many times in our lives, right and wrong, true or false, it can be relative. On the holiday of Yom Kippur, we recite a prayer called the al a, pl- a prayer where we're asking God for forgiveness. So al we ask God for, to forgive us for all the sins that we have committed. There are, number, number, uh, there are a total number of 44 verses in this prayer, twice the Hebrew alphabet. One of the verses reads, al and for all the sins that we committed with our evil inclination. Interesting. What is the impetus for the other 40 sins, 43 sins? Aren't all sins committed with our evil inclination? The answer is no. They are committed with our good inclination. You see, we perform the wrong mitzvah. So that which was a nine true now has become a six false. There's an old saying that goes... The path to hell is paved with good intention. In life, many times we think that we are doing a mitzvah, and we are. The problem is <laughs> that we're doing the wrong mitzvah. Performance of a mitzvah is predicated on a pecking order. It is not always so easy to ascertain whether your choice was correct or not. Many times, we only recognize our error in hindsight. That's if we recognize it at all. We read in the beginning of the portion of Ayesha where that Yosef informed on his brothers to their father. His intent was a nine, truth, but in reality, it was a six, Loshin Hara, tail-bearing. The results of his informing on his brothers was that he was brought down to Egypt and sold as a slave to Potiphar. Now, chapter nine begins with Yosef's servitude in the house of Potiphar and how Potiphar's wife attempts to seduce him. Rashi, commenting on the opening verse in chapter 39, states that the account of Potiphar's wife is next to the account of Tamar, the daughter-in-law of Yehuda, who seduced him. This is to tell us that just as Tamar acted for the sake of heaven, so too did Potiphar's wife act for the sake of heaven. She saw through her astrologers that she was destined to bear children from him. Now, however, she wasn't sure as to whether it would be brought through her or through her daughter. So Rashi testifies that initially her motives were pure, a nine, truth. She was concerned that if 
that it would be a denigration if her daughter were to marry a slave, even one that had been freed. So she chose to have an affair with Yosef instead. And when she would bear a child, everyone would naturally assume that it was her husband's. However, when Yosef refused to succumb to her advances, well, she then accused him of rape, a six false. Her false accusation should have cost Yosef his life. Miraculously, God orchestrated that he be incarcerated in a prison, which eventually led to him becoming the viceroy of Egypt. Keeping the nine upright, truth, is not always an easy task. More often than not, it falls over and turns into a six. We see in the Torah with the story of Korah and his assembly. They began their argument based on an elevated ideal. They wanted to obtain a higher spiritual plateau in their service of God Almighty. They began their quest as a nine, truth. But then, they let their egos dictate their action and the nine, truth, quickly became a six, false. Their intent was proper, in fact, even admirable, but their execution was not. As Moshe himself told them, I too wanted to be the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Aaron was God's choice, not mine. We also see in the Torah with the debacle at Shittim, where as many as 200,000 men died. The members from the tribe of Shimon were dying, and they demanded that their pre prince, Zimri ben Salu, take some action. He reasoned that if he allowed the men of his tribe to stay at Shittim, that they would be culpable of serving an idol, which is punishable by death. He therefore decided that since their intent was really only to have relations with the Midianite women, not to serve idols, he concluded that it would be the better of two evils to bring the members of his tribe back to the camp of the Israelites. Now, it may not be proper to have relations with a non-Jewish woman, but it is not a transgression that would be punishable with death. So he brought the members of his tribe back to the camp. Now, up until that point, he was still a nine truth. But once he came into the camp with Cosby, the Midianite princess, and he publicly, publicly taunted Moshe with his question concerning the permissibility of having relations with her, well, his nine quickly fell and became a six false, and he paid the price with his life. The Torah also seems to indicate that differentiating between a nine truth and a six falsehood is really not easy to recognize. We notice that the, with the incident with Pinchas killing Zimri and Cosby, which occurs at the end of the Torah portion of Balak. However, Pinchas' reward is only mentioned at the beginning of the next portion, Pinchas. But why? We would have thought that since they are really one story, that both the incident and the reward should have been stated either at the end of the portion of Bullock or at the beginning of the portion of Pinchas. So why did the Torah separate them into two separate portions? Now the answer to the question may well center on the difficulty for one to perform a mitzvah from start to finish and stay on track. Keep the act a truth. The Torah implies that by first mentioning his act in one portion and then only after careful scrutiny does it concur that his actions were consistent from start to finish. It was a truth and he was rewarded accordingly. Let us examine the sin of the golden calf. Moshe Rabbeinu Moses, our teacher, was late coming back from the mountain. The people were concerned. They thought that Moshe was dead and that they were now without a leader. They were in need of someone or something to intercede on their behalf before God Almighty. So, so as to buy some time, Aaron told the people to bring him their wives and children's jewelry. And then he would fashion a cap for them. He was hoping that it would take quite a while before the men would be able to convince their wives and children to give up their jewelry so that he could make the cap. Well, he was right. The righteous women of the generation refused to give their husband any of their jewelry. So the men brought their own earrings, and it was done quickly. Now, Aaron's intent was righteous, a truth, 
but his action, even though it was not his intent, was disastrous, false. He had been instrumental in fashioning the golden calf, which was the cause of Moshe's breaking the first set of tablets. In addition, his action put the lives of all of the people in jeopardy as God threatened to destroy the whole nation. Aaron paid dearly for his, act, for his error. Shortly after the incident with the calf, his two illustrious sons, Nadav and Abihu, both died, in part, due to their father's involvement in the making of the golden calf. Now, Moshe hit the rock. He was instructed by God Almighty to speak to the rock. If he had done so, then everything would have been fine, but somehow he spoke to the wrong rock, and when he was chided by the lowest of the people for not producing the water immediately, he became angry, and then he struck the rock, not once, but twice. He began his mission as a truth, following the command of God Almighty, but then his anger got the best of him, and the nine, the truth fell over and became a six, false. Rashi commenting on verse 21-12, where God rebukes Moshe with the words, because you did not have them believe in me, the Hakti Shani, to sanctify me. Rashi states, For if he had spoken to the rock, and it would have brought forth water, I would have been sanctified in the eyes of the congregation. They would have said, If this rock, which does not speak, nor does it hear, nor does it require any sustenance, yet it still fulfills the word of God Almighty, then certainly, Certainly we should do the same. Now the Chidushi Arim, the Gera Rebbe, commented that Moshe in his great love of the children of Israel wanted to remove this claim and show that sometimes even a rock needs to be struck to fulfill God's decree. So too, the children of Israel, sometimes the word of God is not enough for them to follow. They too need to be struck. And just like with the golden calf where Moshe offered up his life to save the people, we witness here once again that due to his great love of the children of Israel, Moshe was willing to counteract God's command. He was willing to give up his own life once again to save the nation. So here we witness a case where the question still remains. Was Moshe's decision to hit the rock a nine and then became a six or was it always a nine that only appeared like it might be a six, but in reality always remained a truth from beginning to end? Again, an example of our original question of which is the definitely correct answer, the truth. A strong beginning is essential for any chance of success in any arena. But in order to achieve a true and lasting success, it must be accompanied with consistency, staying the course, playing the long game. Having a great swing is not enough. The key to a successful shot in any sport is the follow-through. At, uh, start, at the starting line of a marathon, there are many thousands of people who begin. But when the race is over, how many ever really cross the finish line? Life is a marathon. We don't have the permission to stop running or to drop out. We don't have to finish the race. The race really doesn't end as long as we keep running. We only lose when we stop, when we give up, as the states and Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers. Riptarfin used to say, it is not upon you to complete the task, nor are you free to desist from it either. We are constantly in training, whether we realize it or not. We are hopefully preparing ourselves daily through our minor challenges so that when the major challenges occur in our lives, we are better suited to handle them. We have to practice daily to develop our ability to stay the course, to follow the path of truth and nine, and not be lulled into believing that we have this under control. We never, never have life under control. For the most part, we are always playing defense. Life is a constant challenge. And when you no longer think so, well, guess what? 
you have already lost. Your nine truth has become a six false. There was a time years ago when I was attempting to extend a kindness to a dear friend of mine. I was bothered by the fact that another person was making my efforts difficult. Well, at first I just associated it with that person's personality. I knew that they were strong-willed and at times they could be inflexible. It happened that I was inspired to re-examine the situation and also my reaction to it. You know, in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Father 2.4, Hillel stated, Do not condemn your fellow man until you have stood in their place. Theory? Hmm. Theory doesn't always tell us the truth. However, experience. Experience never lies. On a closer examination, I came to realize that though my intentions were well-meaning, even selfless, still the other individual's actions under the circumstances were totally correct. Their mitzvah trumped mine. I apologized. My nine had become a six, but I righted it. Now, so Judaism is all about reviewing, reviewing everything that we've learned. As the Talmud states, even a hundred times, we constantly need to review, to reassess our actions. We need to connect them to our thoughts, our goals, and our ambitions. Obstacles on the roads are not, are not a problem. <laughs> they are only a sign that we are on the right path. As we read in the Torah, even the greatest of people turn their nines into sixes. The important lesson for us to remember is that they did not let their sixes remain sixes. They labored to put them upright again and turn them back into a nine. Truth, once again. And with that, let us strive to turn all of our deeds, sixes into nines, and to help usher in the coming of Sheikh Zakanu quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending, for listening, and uh, again, God should bless you all with health and with happiness and with safety. Um, again, we wish you Shabbat Shalom. Again, this class will be followed by a musical rendition. I hope you stay and listen to it, and again, enjoy. God bless. Thank you for attending.